Hey guys, this is Robert Breedlove from the What Is Money Show. And as you've learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to facilitate financial security for all. They accomplish this by bringing a high level of professionalization and sophistication to the Bitcoin marketplace. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. By using Nidig, you will gain access to an end-to-end -end institutional grade platform, providing Bitcoin OTC transactions, Bitcoin collateralized borrowing, secure custody, asset management, derivatives, financing, market research, and more. And all of these services meet the highest regulatory governance and audit standards. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and is leading the way for ongoing institutional adoption in this nascent asset class. So please be sure to check out Nidig as a single source for all your Bitcoin needs. Max, welcome back to the What Is Money show. Um, Thank you very much, Robert. Glad to have you here. Looking forward to continuing this thought-provoking discussion about Rothbard's book, The Ethics of Liberty. And we left off uh, on a discussion about natural law. And I'll just open this with one excerpt from Rothbard's book. He says, quote, the natural law ethic decrees that for all living things, quote unquote, goodness is the fulfillment of what is best for that type of creature. Unquote. So, this concept of natural law, it's very foreign to a lot of people. And I think it sounds like a subjective moral position to most, right? This, the, the, the rough understanding I think I had of it before getting into it was the pursuit of life, liberty, and property, or what, you know, we sort of transfigured here in the U.S. Constitution, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, but really, this is these aims are the basis of civilization. And I believe Rothbard is making the case that reason is an objective faculty of humans and that it can be used to discover uh, a, I guess a law, a law, a set of laws, moral principles that are objectively best for human existence. Um, am I, is this going down the right path? I mean, it just, how would you describe the objective versus subjective nature of natural law and how it relates to um, the way we construct ourselves and organize ourselves. Yeah, Rothbard's def or excerpt here and definition of natural law is really interesting. And it's a bit similar to Ayn Rand's view here, right? That there is, is some, whatever is, is good for an organization or, or organism, right? Whatever makes it thrive uh, is ultimately a good thing to do. Right? The, mm. uh, that kind of presupposes, uh, I, I would guess, flourishing uh, and uh, expansion of of activity maybe as uh, as an ultimate goal right um a and and then to that aspect of subjective or objective maybe let's look at a, a different definition of natural law that i'm pulling from mark passio which has done a, a phenomenal work on the topic too uh, and that is that natural law is a non-man-made objective and immutable conditions that govern the consequences of human behavior. I would change that slightly to that govern the consequences of human action mm. uh, to mm -hmm. keep it in the praxeological realm. Um, but this is really interesting. So these, these consequences are not man-made, right? So it's uh, similar to gravity. That's not a concept that man creates. That's just an, a natural fact, right? Uh, and that's contradictory to, for example, the, the statist philosophy that men can can dictate uh, what is is right and wrong. 
um, uh, and that this is a, a different um, fundamentally, uh, and it's it's immutable, right? So this governs at all times and at all places, right? It does not change via some arbitrary lines drawn on the map as state uh, regulation does, right? This applies everywhere. Gravity is the same. Uh, mm -hmm. The principles of gravity are the same, regardless on what place you are on this planet, arguably even if you're on a different planet, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, even if humans would uh, go to Mars, right? The, the natural law conditions would still apply. Um, and so that govern the consequences of human behavior. And maybe one way to look at this is um, that uh, on, on a larger scale, uh, as uh, morality defined as the, the adherence to this natural law um, increases in the individual, uh, then the freedom of that individual increases and, and the prosperity and, and uh, yeah. And the same applies uh, on the macro scale, right? So on the macro scale, as morality increases, freedom increases. And as morality declines, freedom declines. And so when people no longer understand and value their individual sovereignty articulated in the natural law tradition, uh, in, the, in the property rights tradition, uh, then, well, that, that leads to tyranny. Um, right. But when individuals defend their property rights and, and recognize the sovereign rights that they have, then that ultimately leads uh, to a, the, the best outcome for everyone. Okay, so I agree with the Rothbardian perspective that reason is an objective faculty of humans. I think we, we touched on this last time, that seems very reasonable. Um, where I'm a little bit unclear, though, is we're saying that the natural law ethic decrees for all living things that goodness is the fulfillment of what is best for that type of creature. So we could say then that goodness is really a measure of how well that organism is fit to its environment or conditions. It seems like it's almost a metric of Darwinian fitness. If it's saying the fulfillment of what is best for that type of creature, I mean, what is best for that type of creature is uh, whatever it's evolved to do, frankly. So where, this is where I get a little bit unclear on natural law and the objectivity of it specifically, because it seems like if we're looking at it through the lens of Darwinian fitness, that for an, any individual human, you could say that their um, optimal strategy, their optimal Darwinian strategy could be cooperative, right? There could be to adhere to natural law and trade with one another, respect the property rights of one another. But it, at least in a shorter time horizon, a more like a more biological immediate time horizon, theft and violence can also be um, a, a optimal resource strategy under certain conditions, right? It's this kind of gets back to the whole beginning of agriculture where it was took a lot of time to plant and and get uh bring the farms into production but then someone that a specialist in violence could come in and commandeer the farm with much lower effort overall but reap the fruits of the labor so i'm i'm curious here how much of this is like an objective natural law and how much of it is derived from our economic and technological realities. So to your point of, of cause and effect, um, it, it is not that the effect of your action is, is immediate, mm. right? And there might be short-term um, benefits mm. while long-term, much stronger negative downsides, right? So, so yes, theft is great in, in the short run, mm -hmm. right? But in the long run, it kicks you around in the ass, right? And and the same probably with morality. Like if you if you decrease morality for for a short amount, you're gonna have a great party, right? But right. in the long run, society is gonna decline, uh, and that's also uh, greatly elaborated in in the Austrian business cycle theory, right? Printing money mm -hmm. in the short right. term leads to the boom. It's mm -hmm. a massive party, right? Everyone yeah. spends, everyone invests, and all that, that's a massive resource consumption, and everyone thinks he's rich. 
right? But that later, you know, much, much, much later, temporally, leads to a, a, a massive downside, right? The bust, uh, where that shows the, the malinvestment of the, of the resources. So it, it would be great, you know, if, if there would be an instant um, consequence to immoral behavior. Right. right. Like you steal from someone and it instantly, you know, you get slapped in the face from a magic angel somehow flying around. Right. You know, that would be great because that's, you know, a, a uh, like a bad behavior and instant uh, bad response or negative consequence to that. Right. Right. Uh, probably humans would pretty quickly figure out not to do immoral stuff. Uh, um, if, well, basically any stuff, if that type of conditioning is applied, but that's not really how natural law works, right? Natural law is a, it's, it's a much uh, slower time scale. You know, it's, it's uh, both on the micro level as well as on the macro level, right? Where we're talking about generational drifts here uh, in societies raising and, and collapsing. That's, that's millennia often. Um, so this is this is a really long game, and the the yeah the the short term consequences should not be overestimated. Okay, that makes sense. So, and this is interesting. So so debt, deception, theft, um, they can have immediate gains, but they create long term consequences or cost. Uh, so the, is this somewhat like a this natural law ethic is almost like karma in a way, right? It's like to do something wrong that maybe seem immediately gratifying or or rewarding or beneficial in some way can just create these longer term consequences, which gets into this gets back to like Hazlitt economics, right? The seen and the unseen. We see this immediate benefit of whatever it is, printing money, uh, telling a lie, right? Telling a lie can get you out of a situation in the short run. But the problem is you've now created this little false reality that you have to continually cover up, right? Like you tell one lie then you have to tell a few more. If someone else finds out about it, you have to tell more lies. Same with printing money, right? Which is, and this is really interesting, this connection actually between debt and deception, because in the Bible, the, the, as I understand it, the words translated from Greek that mean both debt and deception have the same etymological roots, like lying and debt are very closely related. Um, I don't know if it was from Hebrew or from Greek. I can't recall, but there's there's a close connection there. Uh, I, I just read this book, Makers and Takers, that, that drew out that connection. And so to your point, there's this, I guess you would say this is a lag in feedback loops. Right, where you, you're doing a certain action, getting some immediate gain or benefit, but creating a longer term cost. And because there's a lag, as you said, there's not an angel coming from the sky and giving you a slap on the face once you do it. This lag and feedback loops kind of prevents something more like a Pavlovian conditioning where you would know immediately, oh, you tell a lie and you get slapped, you know, that's a bad thing. Um, is that then what this is more connected to? Is more of like a karmic? type law you know i i've been fascinated by how different schools of thought talk about pretty much the same thing you know mm. like uh, many people standing in front of the elephant you know touching parts of it and mm. just describing the whole in their own unique spin on it and um for example, you know, the, the, the karma tradition is, is basically that, right? That's uh, the, and the, the long-term consequences go even into your next life, right? The, the, the action that you take, uh, not just today, but over your entire lifetime, have long-lasting consequences, right? So you mm. better behave properly, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> basically. Um, and, uh, you know, that goes into also Rosicrucianism, Gnosticism, um, the, the alchemists, right? There right. are, uh, uh, yeah, masonry and, and all many, many different, uh, maybe occulted schools of, of wisdom uh, talk about this same thing. Like, what are the consequences for your behavior? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how can you manifest what you actually want to accomplish, mm -hmm. right? And understanding the... Uh, the governing consequences of behavior is really useful for that, right? right? To understand gravity is really useful for you, for you, 
right? And to understand the long-term karmic consequences, so to say, uh, of your action is very useful. Yes, because right. that helps you to look beyond the short term. Right? In, in a sense, it, it, it helps you to decrease your time preference, right? Yeah. To, to, to not just be enthralled in the here uh, and, and now and in the very short term, but to think ahead and to use your reason again to do so. And mm. this is maybe where Rothbard makes the most monumental contribution to this ancient school of thought. Uh, and that is to apply um, the praxeological um, um, tradition of starting with first principles, human action, uh, and then using logical deduction uh, to build a, a, a system of thought on top that can be proven uh, within that model. So as long as the base assumption is correct, and as long as every logical step was correct, and logic can be mm -hmm. uh, reviewed and, mm -hmm. and uh, can be correct, uh, then the outcome is correct too, right? And this was applied in the past to economics, uh, and Rothbard now applies the same to, to ethics, right? Asking that question, if we can find a, a universal non-man-made law, if we can discover this simply by our reason, and, and that recognizes that reason is that, that, key, that key spark of, that makes a human human. Right? This is, ethics is a, now, now with Rothbard's take of it, a, a pure human capacity, or at least a pure, an, an entity that is conscious and that has reason and that acts, right? Mm. Especially that acts. Right. Um, so if there would be some alien, right, that, that acts and that has reason and that can communicate uh, mm. with us in, in, in these ways, then this law would still apply uh, to that entity on, and to the actions that that entity takes and right. how these actions interact with the actions that that us humans take right? and right. and this is also why for example then later in the book uh he says that uh animals do not have these natural law rights precisely because they do not have the reason to partition for them and to act them out mm -hmm. right they cannot claim them or they do not claim them mm -hmm. and that's why they are fundamentally different and why this way of looking at the world does not apply to animals or stones, right? Mm. These are different than humans. Mm. Um, it, so it's, it's somewhat of a very humanistic uh, um, way of looking at things, but that's useful because we interact with humans quite a lot. Right. So, so the, the actual expression through reason of claiming these natural law rights is what makes them real, right? You're expressing, you're using reason to express your claim um, to these rights that are based in the reason, based in reasoning. Is that something? Is that correct? It, it, at least when we keep it on the level that ethics of liberty and Mary Rothbard is talking about here. Mm -hmm. If you would, for example, take more of, of the Hindu tradition, right, of, of looking at the natural law principles then they do apply also to animals, right? And you see a, a large uh, portion of, of Hindus being vegan precisely for that reason, mm. because harming another conscious being, right? Uh, more rather than a rational acting being, mm -hmm. right? Is, uh, is, is harmful and has long-term uh, negative ca uh, karmic depth associated, right? So when, mm. when you go out and, and slaughter another animal that has not initiated aggression against you, right? Uh, then you take an innocent life uh, and, and you consume it. It's, it's a parasitic behavior. Um, and if, if your level of analysis is a holistic consciousness, um, as in some spiritual traditions is the fact, then that is, that is absolutely valid. Like that is, that is the right way of, of looking at it inside this model. It makes sense. And I think mm -hmm. that's the main argument of, of many ethical ve vegans is exactly this. Right. was my argument as an ethical vegan for a time. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, especially thanks to Mary Rothbard and to this book, did I understand that there, that there is a key differentiation in the level of scope that this law applies, um, specifically because it now with Mary Rothbard's definition here, it is a purely reasonable construct uh, that can be well, proven in the con in, in the model of human action, right? Of mm. rational, 
conscious action, right? But since animals do not do not do that, right? mm -hmm. they right. don't act. Uh, therefore, the model does not apply to them. Yes. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. So again, this um, dividing line between behavior and action is that action exhibits purpose or intention or premeditation versus behavior being more reflexive or instinctual, right? So that becomes the line then between reasonable life or conscious sentient life and um life that is just acting out of instinct or behavior approximately exactly that and that is you know that goes all the way back to to human action uh and to how ludwig von mises co coined praxeology or well at least articulated it to a, to a much greater extent than before uh, with the definition of focus at the starting point of the analysis, or a starting axiom being the the assumption that 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 is self evident, right? That that is the starting point that has no like previous points, mm -hmm. um, is human action, mm -hmm. and that is not reflexive behavior, right? But mm -hmm. rather that 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 conscious uh, approach of being a individual first and foremost it's human action this is not a collective right mm -hmm. this is the the individual being sovereign uh, and living in a state of uneasiness as ludwig mm -hmm. van mises put it mm -hmm. right uh, having problems uh, yes. and now having the the well the creative spark mm -hmm. to envision a potential future right. with with ways to solve your problem to remove the uneasiness yes right? And then reason is applied to to pick the the best solution out of these many options. Yes. Right. Uh, to and to 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 apply to try your best in in finding uh, it, it, before you even act the the best strategy to act, but then also to live it out. Mm -hmm. Right. So not not just to think about it, but but to act. You know, to right. to change something about it. Um, and this is yeah this is different than than breathing you know or or to an extent even you no know, eating um yes. uh, or or movement even sometimes sure. um as as being more reflexive and th the reason why we why it's okay to leave this out is because reflexive behavior doesn't build cathedrals you right know? C cathedrals and large monuments the 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 large economy that we want to explain in praxeological tradition again that's different to ethical to uh, ethics tradition uh is that that we want to explain these these large um creations that are that are very much based on human reason and an entrepreneurial genius mm -hmm. and so economics explains that and murray rothbard now takes the same uh, epistemological approach uh to answer the question of overall governing behaviors of our consequences of the actions yeah, well said. Um, so let's, okay. So me, I'm, it seems like Austrian economics and natural law are both pointing towards this unscientifically discovered or, or, uh, non empirical fabric of reality in a way that is related to intentions and actions. So one of, one of the light bulb moments for me with, with Austrian economics was the materialist worldview. We tend to think it's just things, right? You know, atoms and things and whatever moving around in the world. But the alternate viewpoint to that through the lens of praxeology or Austrian economics is that human beings are actually channeling their intentions through things. And then these things are becoming means towards ends. And ends are these, again, generated by reason, these, these um, imagined future states. So we have the present state that is where we're always dissatisfied, or to use Mises' term, uneasy. We have some visualization of a future state we're working towards, which is what we value, by the way, right? Some valuable state exactly. that we don't have today. And we're using the power of intention and action to transform the material world into means proper to those ends. 
So you're trying to close the gap with your reason, I guess. And so there's two, there's two parallel worlds going on, right? There's the materialist, you know, causal reality unfolding, but there's also this often more important reality of human action, which is this confluence of intentionality and purpose, uh, you know, cooperating and competing and transforming the world, making the world more different aspects of the world, more or less significant based on the aims of market actors. And, you know, it is fundamentally different because to your point with an animal is maybe just one example, like a wolf will just eat until he's full, right? He'll just gorge on meat. He'll eat 40 pounds of meat in a sitting, but a human could have say this valued end state of, Hey, I want to get in shape for a wedding or something like that. And they can control their animal instincts in a moment based on this visualization of the future. So I wonder, you know, I know this is very speculative. Um, I brought up this book before Leela. I don't know if I've mentioned it to you. It's written by Robert Persig, who wrote Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. He wrote a book 15, 20 years later called Leela. And it posits that causality is not real, actually, or it's, it's one aspect of what's real. The other aspect is value. So he says you could take the entire scientific, the whole corpus of scientific knowledge, and you could strip out A causes B, and you could replace it with B values precondition A. It would change none of the data, but it would radically change the interpretation. So I, and this is clearly a speculation, but it seems like Austrian economics and natural law is like touching on something that hasn't been empirically proven yet. I don't know if it even can be empirically proven, right? This may just be something that's that resists uh, empirical proof, but it is as if not more important to our understanding of the world than pure empiricism. Yes. And that's what I meant previously with that many spiritual tradition talk about the same thing, right? But they provide more yes. spiritual, um, not, not, scientific, not, not scientifically rigorous yes. um, uh, approaches, which isn't even a bad thing. Okay, like like spirituality and you know belief is 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 fundamental to the human existence, um, but you know science is cool too, and yes. having a, a irrefutable proof of something is pretty nice as well, yes. right? Uh, because when you re truly can prove something, then you ultimately have uh, the the full understanding of it, and you can use that understanding to build on top of it. Right? Once you understand gravity and, and air pressure, you know, and, and wind, then you can build aircrafts, mm. right? That's, that's very useful. Mm. So, so being able to prove the, the reality of things, very mm. cool, right? And, and we saw that with the scientific revolution over these last uh, hundreds of years, uh, how, how much of a human, to, to how much of a human flourishing that has led uh, right. on, on numerous different indicators. And now, and this is again where we talk about epistemology and the great book to read on this is, is from Ludwig von Mises' Theory and History um, that goes into the different ways to look at, well, economics also. Um, and that being either in the um, empiricist view, right, that you go out and you measure things and you aggregate numbers and you, you think in collective modeling of data, um, that is one approach, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that might work in physics, right? In, in physics, you can use that approach uh, to go outside, you know, lift, uh, lift a stone up, drop it, see it fall to the ground, mm -hmm. record the data a hundred times, a thousand times, right? And eventually you can be pretty certain about next time I'm going to raise the stone and drop him, it's going to drop again right. uh, at the same speed as before, right? And, and you can... But the thing is, again, humans are not rocks, right? They don't behave deterministically in a sense. They, they have the freedom to choose, right? To, in, to, in, to imagine multiple different futures, right? And, and to choose which one of those to follow, right? Mm -hmm. We can set a goal out of millions of goals, right? The opportunity costs uh, for any action is always infinite. You mm -hmm. could spend your time and energy on everything right now, mm -hmm. but in this very moment, I'm spending it on talking to you. Right. right? Th this means that all the opportunity cost for being right here right now is infinite. 
right? Yes. There's always a choice involved. Yes. Uh, and th that that's what makes us different from rocks, right? Rocks don't choose, mm. they just fall. Right. So then perhaps Rothbard would be making the case that to understand the principles of natural law would let us build a civilization that is more sophisticated, robust, you know, just better, I guess, across all dimensions, similar to how understanding the principles of civil engineering lets us build a, a better bridge or a better building, right? There's, there's something, there's something objective here, right? This isn't just pure, purely, sub, um, this isn't purely subjective, I guess. And the other, th the, and I like yeah. this comparison between the the wisdom traditions and the religious traditions and science where they've kind of pointed, as you said, they, they're all talking about the same thing roughly it, is then praxeology and Austrian economics is kind of the, the interface between the two. Cause it's applying this rigorous deductive scientific approach, but it's talking about the subjective domain of values and morals. And I guess natural law is kind of, is sort of where the two meet. Well, I mean, let's let's take for example the the Bible and and the the paradise story, right? We 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 have the state where where Adam and Eve are are naked, right, in, in paradise, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they God tells them to do anything but not eat from the the fruit of the tree, right? Mm -hmm. And and later Lucifer says that uh, the the when you eat the fruits of the tree, you will understand the the difference to to good and evil, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and and you will become like God, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then later they eat it and they become conscious, uh, so to say, uh, and they become reasonable, right? Uh, and uh, he, no, is proven here in this reasonable treatise of ethics or liberty. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you have reason, you can formulate the, the long-term consequences of good and bad behavior. Mm -hmm. And you can create a irrefutable proof for that. The irrefutable proof is in ethics of liberty and any individual with the capacity to reason can understand and can confirm and verify this proof to be accurate. Mm. Right? And Adam and Eve got reasonable. They got conscience. Mm. Therefore, they have the power to understand what is written in the book Ethics for Liberty. Mm. Obviously, the book wasn't written back then, <laughs> but they can use the, the only tool that they need to write the book is reason. Right. That's, that's it. Interesting. So, and, you know, Peterson's talked about this a lot, describing the, the fall of man in this, in, as told in the story of Adam and Eve as kind of like the discovery of time in a way. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like that reason is that power for us to penetrate forward in time, right? We can comprehend the future consequences of our action, whether we follow a path of instinct or to just eat, you know, everything we can and hump everything we can and hope for the best, or we can follow this divergent path of, I'm going to eat a little bit less today, uh, you know, develop rapport and trust with my, my people here and plan for tomorrow or next season or next year. Um, and it, so I guess reason then is closely related to this aspect of self-consciousness across time that we can reflect on ourselves and consider our future state. Yes, absolutely. And Ludwig von Mises, again, lays this out beautifully in, in human action with, in, and in praxeology, that once you, you, you know, he assumes human action, you know, and again, this is, this is a, a reasonable construct. So it is a, a creation of reason, uh, but it starts with human action, right? But what, what is action, if not change over time, you know, you are mm -hmm. in the state of right. uneasiness, and then you solve the situation and you're no longer in a state of uneasiness. That is time, you know, mm. before and after the action. Right, right. The, the concept of time is discovered with the discovery of reason. It goes hand in hand, you know. That's an incredible way to look at it. And then it lends all the credence. Again, we're coming back to time preference, right? The more, the lower your time preference, the more you're taking into account your future self and other future selves. And therefore they're, it's almost indistinguishable from being more reasonable, right? The more, the more your decision in the present accounts for 
possible futures, deeper, further possible futures, the more reasonable you're being in a way. Um, yes, absolutely. And this is, again, such great uh, parallel between Peterson and Mises. You know, as Peterson says that uh, even you as the individual are not alone. You're not, uh, you know, you you're consist of a group of yourself across time. Right? It's right. not just you today. It was you a year ago and you tomorrow and you in a year. Right. That's all you. That uh, You are a collective, so to say, of the same individual across time. Yes. And this is this is, again, so much what, what Mises talks about. Right. That uh, that that aspect of uh, of understanding the 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 long term causal relationships of your actions. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, that uh, and the cool thing about prax praxeology is that it starts at the isolated individual. You know, um, it's uh, we start slow and build up big, right? We don't try to explain the entire complex economy at first, right? We first try to explain human action, one person alone, mm -hmm. right, on the lonely island. But the same concept works, like the, the same logical reasoning works on the individual scale as well as on the macro scale. Mm. And the reason why that is, is because uh, as above, so below, Right mm, uh, yeah. on the micro scale, we have a fractional representation of a of a market economy of yes. you and you in the past and you in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that that's incredible. Yeah, th this gets to that point of all human action is a trade. Right, we're making exchanges with our future self, no matter what we do. Because to your earlier point, the opportunity cost is always infinite. So, what are you trading away? you know, in terms of this infinite opportunity cost for present action, which is an expression of your value, right? It's what you value most is what you're doing in any moment. Um, exactly. And and again, this massive uh, um, potential of opportunity cost is assumed in the praxeological model with the marginal diminishing uh, uh, utility, right. right? That entire concept is is deduced out of human action Right. That right. that means that you have uh, um, diminishing margining returns with with uh, with everything. Right. And this 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 is the entire subjective theory of value. Right. So this is, again, so it's the core of praxeology. Really, right. it's it, everyone's talking about the same thing. Yeah, that's incredible. And then the the, the one last point I'll put on that is uh, Peterson makes this brilliant connection. Again, if so, if self-consciousness is a form of reasonableness, self-consciousness to tie it back to Adam and Eve, when they say it's the discovery of the knowledge of good and evil, self-consciousness is a prerequisite to being evil because what it essentially is, is you have identified a way that you can be hurt. You've identified your own vulnerability. You can then choose to go and exploit that vulnerability in someone else. So like, I know this will hurt me. So I'm assuming it will hurt him or her. And that is evil. So there's this, it, with this discovery of reason and self-consciousness comes the moral dimension, which so, exactly. much, so much of this speaks to. And even, even worse, it was your fault, right? Mm -hmm. You had the power to understand the consequences of your action before you even took the action. Right, right, right. right. You could use reason a priori to, yeah. to think ahead and to, to, to create a, a, a you know, this imagination of how things will play out. You know, you, you play things out in your mind, you play games, you mimic other people, yeah. right? Uh, and this is th exactly because you have that capability, you can estimate uh, how your action will play out in the future. And then if you naively walk off a cliff and you fall down, it was your fault mm -hmm. because you could have understood gravity and the gravity of your situation by jumping off the cliff. Right. And the same is now true thanks to Rothbard's explanation in this book, for ethics, the reason of the 20th century and the tyranny uh, on this large scale was our fault because we did not understand the causal relationship yes. of human action. Yes. And that when you steal from people and you lie to people, then shit will hit the fan yes. and people wow. will get killed, many yes. of them. And yes. it was our fault. We yes. could, we, it, it, it's obvious, it's so easy to understand that that will lead to a bad outcome, yet still, for whatever reason, uh, we, we we don't grasp it. Uh, and that makes us evil, yes? Well, yeah, so it's amazing that 
Yeah, this is so firmly rooted, you know, again, because it's deduced from first principles essentially forward. But we, I guess, because we have this widespread materialist viewpoint, uh, which a lot of Austrians call scientism, right? Where you, we think um, everything's just reducible to number and cause and effect and empiricism, frankly, that they're entirely ignorant of this. Right. It's, it, you know, in a materialist viewpoint, morals are just some little local fiction that you create and try to get other people to agree with. But the natural law perspective is that, no, you're there's something fundamental as real as space and time is to a materialist. This moral fabric is as real to a natural law theorist. Um, it's staggering, honestly. And, you know, the, the past few years have just been one mind blowing experience after another and studying all of this to see how it connects to, you know, you, you, it's like a scientific bridge to wisdom traditions or to mythology or to, or to religion. Um, and it's just been an incredible experience. So maybe we can take this then to the concept of rationality, which again, a, a lot of what we're referring to here is what the Bible calls the logos right? And this is the Greek word for word or ratio. Um, and the, you know, ratio is clearly at the root word of rationality. And I'll, I'll read one of Rothbard's interpretations of, of rationality here, but I think the way I think about it is, so we have these slices of ourselves across time. We're running these simulations, right? Between our present state and our ideal future state. And you're running multiple simu simulations and you're comparing them right it's an, a ratio you're creating like here's how much mm -hmm. value i interpret here's the cost and your con it's a matter of comparison in the same way words are a matter of comparison right they don't have they have the most meaning when you compare them to one another and put them in certain orders and consider the grammar right there's a the, the ratio is so fundamental to perception if you will um so i'll read this uh somewhat long excerpt to just get us started on rationality. Rothbard says, quote, according to the positivistic interpretation of relativism, which prevails in present day social science, reason can tell us which means are conducive to which ends. It cannot tell us which attainable ends are to be preferred to other attainable ends. Reason cannot tell us that we ought to choose attainable ends. If someone, quote, loves him who desires the impossible, unquote, reason may tell him that he acts irrationally, but it cannot tell him that he ought to act rationally or that acting irrationally is acting badly or basely. If rational conduct consists in choosing the right means for the right end, relativism teaches in effect that rational conduct is impossible. So. I mean, I think he's more or less destroying the concept of, of relativism here. Um, y yes, and, and just to hammer home how, how much of a gravity of that statement is, he is even contradicting his beloved master Ludwig van Mises here, right? In, in his entire line of work, Mises was always extremely careful and precise to have a wertfreie, a, a value-free rational argumentation of mm. the consequences of, of action, right? Like, um, uh, you know, as was laid out here, like, when you do this, that will happen. He never said, prefer this end to that end, right? He was right. always just explaining how things are, you know, and, and the consequences. If you do this, then that will happen, rather than you should prioritize this over that. Um, and that was because Mises did not dared to go as far with being radical of reason and and in love with the logos and it, it by the way it's a miracle that that mises successfully escaped uh the the nazi war front in in europe by the mm -hmm. way read the book the last night of liberalism mm -hmm. uh, a great biography uh, biography over ludwig van mises written by jörg de holtzmann must read really it's, it's breathtaking but because mises escaped to america and uh the the ra radical brains like rothbard and uh others have then discovered this line of thinking they really took it to the to the next level and ethics of liberty is a, a gigantic leap forward really this this is 
yeah, this this is a complete de demolition demolishing of uh, of uh, um, it, yeah, it's it's like it's a logical proof. Um, there's there's really not much around it. This, it is truly incredible, um, and I, I think this gets at something that Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris were debating actually, and this may contradict Peterson's stance. Is it? You know, I forget, maybe it was Hume that said this, but Peterson's repeated it, that you can't get an ought from an is. Exactly. What, what he's saying essentially is you can't get uh, a proper moral aim from an objective set of facts, right? The facts can tell you what is, but it can't tell you what you should do about it. Like what you should do about it is a subjectively determined um, aim, frankly. But I, and tell me if I'm wrong here, because I'm still struggling to, interpret Rothbard. He's making the point that the rash. So he says here at the end, if rational conduct consists in choosing the right means for the right end, relativism teaches an effect that rational conduct is impossible. So is he then saying that whatever optimizes for the reasonableness of man or from the reasonable reasonableness of man is an objective moral direction like we should be the actions we should take should always try and optimize or honor the individual reason of man above, above all else is it, i'm struggling here um I guess I could just ask, what is the actual contradiction he's making to Mises? Like, what is the line Mises would not cross that Rothbard then crosses? Um, to, yeah, so the way to go about the, the uh, you cannot derive an, an art from an is, um, uh, sorry, the other way around. <laughs> you no, cannot no, derive an is from That's right. You can't oh, get an art from an is. So basically is being what is scientifically proven or empirically factual, the ought being what you should do about it, what aim you should select based on the facts. Exactly. And so the, the way that Rothbard goes about this problem in this book, and it's later expanded upon by Hans Hermann Hoppe in the argumentational ethics, mm. is that if you want to make a claim uh, to, a, to, a, to a scarce resource, basically, then you need to make that claim, well, right here, right now, uh, somehow with your physical body, right? Mm -hmm. So by, by making a claim, you are already manifesting as the being that is the starting point of praxeological reasoning, right? By, by saying a word, by speaking up, you're acting, right? Uh, and that means that whatever you do is in the realm of praxeological analysis. Uh, and again, we have a, a chain of proofs, logical proofs, uh, to build up to, you know, the, the grand praxeological tradition. Mm -hmm. um, so by, for example, by saying that uh, I, I am not a, a, you know, free sovereign uh, human being, you know, I'm, uh, that uh, like I'm, I, I do not own my body, for example, just by me saying that uh, it's, it, it's logically inconsistent. Because I'm vocalizing literally, uh, you know, my body to perform these sounds, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm standing right here in, in this meat space and I'm occupying space, you know, a scarce space even. The space that I'm occupying, nobody else can occupy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so while saying that property rights don't exist, uh, I, I cannot say that claim without actually having property rights in my body. Right, 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 right. Yes, yes. Yeah, you're occupying space, you're controlling your most personal property, which is you, your body, your voice, whatever, which is similar. Again, it's axiomatic because it's like Mises saying, man must act. If you try to not act, that is an action, right? You're purposefully not or attempting to not act, which is itself an action. Um, okay, so this is, I think, murky and confusing, which is great because we get to work through it. Um, what I want to do now is do just a little bit of a, a side 
branch here into the definitions of philosophy and value and then come back to natural law ethics, which I hope will help explain this um, a little more clearly. So on the topic of, and I'm doing this because he actually uses these terms in, in natural law ethics. So to first define philosophy, Rothbard says, quote, philosophy in the sense in which the word is used when scholasticism is contrasted with other philosophies is an attempt on the part of man's unaided reason to give a fundamental explanation of the nature of things, unquote. So he's connecting here philosophy as being the direct product of this objective faculty that we have called reason. Um, what yes. what is how does this relate to to scholasticism, and what does he mean by contrasted with other philosophies? Uh, the the scholastics were were I. I I believe uh, Catholic scholars in Spain uh, that uh, had the this uh, they kind of laid out the the foundations of what is today praxeology, mm. right? So so they had they, they had axiomatic starting points and used logical deduction uh, from there, um, and uh, it, they created a, a great amount of, of economic knowledge, uh, which was at that time unparalleled, mm. right? Because, well, uh, you know, praxeology is very useful to look at economics, so they mm -hmm. were really great economic scholars. Um, and uh, also moral scholars, right? So uh, because they were uh, uh, Catholics, um, obviously they were interested in morals. Mm. Um, and here again, I think that that's interesting because that's, that shows that people who, who are interested in, in let, let's say, spiritual morality uh, can also become very interested in, in Austrian economics mm. uh, because it talks about the same thing, right? Yes, uh, yes. Just from, from a different side. And the cool thing is that you can use the same tools that we use to prove things in Austrian economics to prove things in morality. Yes. Right? So it, it gives you an even stronger conviction uh, in, in, in your set of belief, right? It's, it's a... Uh, it's kind of something like like Peterson has done with with the Bible for me. Like it it just lays out a very reasonable explanation uh, of uh, of of the story that is being told, mm -hmm. right? And that's that's useful. That's that's really nice. Yeah, and so the the I guess philosophy in this sense is more like the original natural science in a way, right? Where he's saying that um, again, there's this is contrary to say the postmodern perception of moral relativism there's there's a way to rigorously deductively prove uh the certain moral aspects w within the natural law tradition which is which is a philosophy in and unto itself basically it's an explanation of the fundamental nature of things right in this case human action or human being um okay so that that's helpful. So philosophy is like the the basis, right? It's like we have reason. You can't even that's the first principle to even say I don't have reason is an expression of reason. <laughs> and then the thing we create first is a philosophy, which is a way it's an explanation of the fundamental fundamental nature of things. And All right, it's so again a, a fundamental human thing, right? Mm -hmm. Animals don't philosophize. Right. Uh, so then this uh, term value, and I, I'm just going to read this excerpt here. I just think it was interesting how he used it. He says, quote, for in natural law ethics, ends are demonstrated to be good or bad for man in var var <laughs> varying degrees. Value here is objective determined by the natural law of every man's being. And here, quote unquote, happiness for man is considered in the commonsensical, contentual sense. Um, so value, he's making the case, and I guess in this sense that it is, uh, are, we, are we back to what, uh, I'm sorry, what was the Darwinian point he made where goodness is the fulfillment of what is best for that type of creature? Seems like he's kind of making that 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 association between goodness and value, that there is an objective direction to it. Yes, and 
uh, he, he lays that out uh, in a, a thought ex a thought experiment in, in the beginning of the book uh, where we have a, a man on a lonely island, right, an isolated individual, and he is uh, about, you know, he's foraging in the forest for food and he stumbles upon a mushroom, right? And so he's right now in a state of uneasiness, right? He's hungry and uh, he tries to find solutions to improve his situation and now he has he stumbles upon a new opportunity which is eating the mushroom uh, and he can now rank that in his in his subjective individual preferences right and maybe he's very hungry and the mushroom looks delicious so that is a good trade-off to expend more time and energy to walk further towards the mushroom and pick it up and eat it right so he would do this based on the assumption that eating the mushroom will alleviate his uneasiness of being hungry. Right. That, is, that is what is pre, uh, presupposed in this action. Right? But then what would happen if a, a second individual stumbles upon the scene and he tells the first that, hey, careful, this mushroom is poisonous. It will kill you. Mm -hmm. right? Now, the the first individual all of a sudden receives new external information no input to digest right to to contemplate to to use in your reasoning because maybe it will change your opportunity costs right maybe it will change the situation uh, as this clearly does because now you learn that eating the mushroom will not lead to you no longer being hungry but instead it will lead to you dying right a, a very different thing and now if, if that individual throws away the mushroom and does not eat it, right, then, then we've kind of established that these two individuals, uh, like we, we can observe by the actions of these two individuals that they value life and they prefer being alive to not being alive, right? And even that the second individual prefers the first individual to be alive, right? Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and funny thing is just today I was out in the forest with with a young kid right and we stumbled uh, like we're walking through and there was this uh, hive of poison ivy you know where you walk in and you get stung and then it hurts a bit and the kid can barely talk right says mama and papa that's it and he's like ow 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 right pointing wow. to the hive and I was I was like Perfect. That's that's exactly it. He's pointing out a danger, right? That he has already understood to be uh, a a potential dangerous path uh, that will lead to, to a different place that you than you thought it would, right? It it will right. hurt you when you thought it will help you, and he is willing to pass along that information to you. Like that's so crazy. He cannot even talk yet, yet yeah. still he thinks that this piece of information is so critical for you to know that he points it out and, and wow. tries to communicate it, right? That's, that's such a, a deep proof that yeah. this young individual values life and values uh, um, less suffering over more suffering. Yes. Yeah, you know, this calls to mind, um, again, back to goodness being what the creature is equipped to do. Uh, in Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, he says something to the effect that humans are designed to cooperate or like the left and right hand or the rows of the upper and lower teeth. And that's what we're equipped to do is to help and interact with one another in trade. So I think that's an excellent point. 